Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Pencil Kings podcast. Today we are talking to James Cornett. I thought it was really cool the way that James contacted me. He said, hey Mitch, I, I really like what you're doing with the podcast. I put out this book. You just had me at book. You, you put out this book for artists. Yeah. And I think it actually hits on something that I'm a huge fan of, which is just, you know, take some action, do something. And uh, you actually did a lot of things over, over the course of the year. And we'll get into exactly what that is. But if you're listening to this and you want to know where you can get the book and uh, any kind of things that we talk about, of course, it will be at pencilkings.com slash James Cornett. That's J-A-M-E-S dash C-O-R-N-E-T-T-E. So welcome to the call, James. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Mitch. Uh, thanks for having me on, man. I'm totally honored. Yeah, I love talking to anybody that's doing something cool. You don't have to be Steven Spielberg to have something interesting to say. Definitely your book was really interesting. Awesome. Where Where are you based, actually? I think that's a good question to start with. I'm in South Jersey. It's Pennsville. It's near Wilmington, Delaware. It's pretty much a rest stop on the way to the shore. It's a little bit of nowhere. The uh, Jersey yeah, Shore Shore? Yeah, South Jersey Shore, yeah. Ocean City, New Jersey. Okay, but, Yeah. cool. Let's just start off with the book. Why don't you tell people just um, the title of the book, obviously, and what the book was about and the purpose of it and how you got started with the idea. Yeah, well, the book's called Surviving a Year. Basically, it's simply 12 uh, practical steps for doing the do uh, 365 days in a row. But the way it came about was uh, I like to shoot photos, I like to draw, I like to make stuff outside of my the day job. And I had done a year long project, I believe it was 2012, basically took a photo every day. And I got a bunch of friends to to join in with me. And after about a month and a half, everybody fell off except for me. And and that's not bragging rights. It's just like, I was bummed out about it. And I was like, wow, man, nobody really wants to stick with this because if you look at the end of a year, you have pretty much documented your life and events in your life for for a whole year. And it's really great to like, look back at that. And just, it's such a rewarding uh, project. So I decided to do it again in 2013. And I had a couple of friends that, hey, man, how did you do that the first time? Are you, you going to try to do it again? How much work is it? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you know what I should do? I should make an ebook on how, how I did it. Something simple that's encouraging just to get other people to try it because it's definitely worth the effort. But it's a lot of effort. And I knew the psychological things that would happen when you're trying to, to complete a project like that. I also, at the same time, wanted to uh, create an ebook. I'd been listening to a bunch of entrepreneurial podcasts and they were always pushing ebooks and print on demand books. And I was like, I'd really like to figure out how to do this. So um, I went through the tedious process of that. And, uh, you know, a year later, I had a book out. Let's go back to the beginning. How many friends did you have that were like, yeah, let's do this in the very beginning? About 12 in the very beginning. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I thought it was a lot less. Yeah. And I was going to say, well, maybe you just didn't have a large enough sample size. And that's why. Most of them were coworkers. And we, we work in the uh, advertising field. So obviously, schedules are crazy. There's times where you're super bored. There's other times when you're getting almost no sleep. So that was part of it. And that was part of the reason I also wanted to put down the, the 12 steps because there's things in there about that. But I mean, like, while, while I was reading that, because the book is, is about photography, and then you did your sketch project after, which I saw your sketches, and I, I was like, wow, these are a lot more than oh, sketches. You're definitely about, spending a good amount of time on these. That about killed me. I don't <laughs> I need to do that one again. Actually, I'm doing a week, uh, a, pro, a piece a week project right now. It's basically a t-shirt design a week. And I actually put those up on Tee Public. But that's a lot more uh, attainable than drawing something every day. Unless it's like a low-level sketch. I think I got myself in trouble by doing some pretty detailed sketches at first. And then I kind of felt like I had to keep that uh, level of it. So, you know, I, I kind of made my own, my own problem with that one. But. With the uh, photographs, I'm, you know, sitting there reading on my Kindle and I've got my phone in my pocket. Is it that hard? Maybe, no, there, during not, that time, I'm sure lots of people had camera phones that you could yeah. just take it out and be like, oh man, it's 11.59 and I'm about to go to bed. Snap. Oh, I had had a few. Then you're done. Some, all my cat pictures are, are the, you know, 11.50 shots. But yeah, I mean, I've honestly, I've seen pictures shot with an iPhone that look better than half the stuff I've shot. And I'm like, wow, man, it's, that's great. Yeah, there really so, is not an excuse. That's what I was kind of digging at because, you know, 11 people fell off and I applaud them for s- sticking to it as, as long as they were able to. Oh, definitely. But, but even with a simple action that takes literally one second, you know, like people couldn't stick with it. And, and what do you think it was? Because you, you knew these people and you said, yeah, you had hectic schedules, but we're talking literally about uh, less than one minute action. I mean, my guess would be that it, it might have been boredom. Like for me, like... 
I want to do something a little bit more than taking a photo a day. I want it to be something special. Like some of mine are a little quirky. I try to make sure that they were a little creative if there was a, or if there was a story yeah, behind definitely. it. But I mean, I still have the, the typical family pictures and things like that or the, you know, the texture shot that I would use in a painting later or something like that. But people just get easily distracted too. But boredom, possibly. I don't know. Yeah, it's weird. I was just writing uh, something for the the Pencil King site yesterday, and we were digging into the research behind like how long it takes to actually build a habit. And there's this old adage that it takes 21 days to build a habit, which is not true. Right. Uh, to build a habit takes 18 to 254 days. When they did the study, they monitored all these people, but the average was 66 days. So if you wanted to stick with it, you got to do it at least two months, and then you're kind of over that mean number of 66. Oh, definitely. Did you find that it got to be a habit where you just like oh this sketching or this photographing uh challenge is, is actually pretty easy because now it's a habit and i just do it it became a struggle when i tried to get too clever with the photo um but the actual process itself was definitely a habit i mean i woke up thinking about what am i going to shoot or i would daydream about it i have a very long commute um, my commute's uh, about an hour and a half on the way so I, I could sit and daydream about stuff or there's a lot of times i would want to pull over and take a shot of something but yeah i, w- I was just thinking about it all the time I don't know if that actually hurt my my day job because it wasn't focused. But uh, yeah, it became a habit. And honestly, halfway through, you have a body of work that you've created. You really don't want to fall off then because you feel like, oh, man, I wasted it. That was the other thing, too. I had a stipulation in there that, hey, if you miss a day, don't worry about it. You know, try not to. You really because you get in the habit of missing and then it just falls apart. But if you did, don't let it sidetrack and just keep going. But uh, yeah, it's it's a real psychological game you would think it'd be a little bit easier but nah it's it's a mental thing really all right so we definitely want to encourage people to go and buy the book and i think for me one of the things i loved is that it's it's a nice easy read it, it took me i think about 40 minutes I, I got though i can't really remember what the exact time was but it's not a long book it's really short and sweet and it gives you exactly what you need so with that can you boil the book down into sort of like what the biggest lessons were there uh, and so if somebody wanted to take up uh, a year-long challenge or even if you just wanted to draw every day for 30 days and you find that is difficult for you, what are some of the things that people can keep in mind that you discovered from doing this multiple times? Well, what I discovered was you get better. You, you, if you really focus on this and try every day, you're automatically going to get better. It really develops your eye and you have a lot of fun. I think my favorite point, not to jump ahead in the book, but the point 12, the final one was time travel. The payoff is at the end of the year, you can look back and you look at those photos and you remember the day that you shot it or the evening that you shot it. You remember what was happening. I mean, it's really cool because it really does kind of embed those memories in your head. And the goal is to be better and to make something that's a piece of art that you're proud of. Is it something that you saw, you know, after a certain number of days, you're like, wow, I can definitely feel I'm getting a lot better. Or was it the introspective part where you looked back and you're like, wow, I can really see the progression. And here's where I made a leap on, you know, February 27th. Uh, this photo is just like heads and tails better than anything before it. And after that, things are better as well. Man, that's a great question. Uh, it's really introspective. I mean, for me, it was, I didn't progressively see stuff get better, but I saw that I guess this is hard to say, but maybe my mind got better in how I would see stuff. Like I would start to formulate what I thought would be a cool shot quicker than before. I used to struggle with that. So that part of it. And then technically, uh, I I think I got a little better technically because I got bored with just a standard issue shot. So I started messing with lighting and things like that. So that little boredom aspect is what really, if you work through that, that's what does make you better because you, you try to, freshen it up a little bit, which means trying new techniques, uh, different lenses, different angles, different subject matter. Because what will happen too, I, I know I'm kind of rambling here, but what would happen for me is there are certain things I like to shoot that are super comfortable. Like I love shooting like still life type stuff. People, very difficult because it's hard to get, you know, that right look or that, that right moment. And it's a lot more, it's a lot of stress. So but yeah, didn't didn't you say you had a run in with the, with, with the police? Sorry to interrupt, but it yeah. just it sparked in my mind. But you you had either one or multiple run ins with the police I, during this photography project. Yeah, what was that all about? So, what happened there? Uh, the terrorists have basically won. So you can't at least at the Paco uh, train system in New Jersey, you're not allowed to stand on the you know the on the uh, the deck and take pictures of, of the trains and train tracks and things like that, which sucks because there's a lot of really awesome graffiti there. 
And I was trying uh-huh. to get some shots and I actually was detained for about 25 minutes by the police. They were actually really cool about it. They didn't take my gear. I didn't argue. And that's the first thing they say. I mean, you can have like the photographer's rights printed out. And as soon as you do that, you're going to lose your gear and you're going to go sit in some room for hours. I figured I'd be polite about it. But yeah, that, that's happened a couple of times. Uh, previous to this, I was actually taking pictures outside of an old theater by my house and a police officer rolled up and asked me what I was doing. I told him what I, you know, as a student, I'm taking pictures of this theater and he kept asking me who I was taking pictures of, like I was some private detective or something. That was a little ridiculous. But I mean, that stuff happens. But if you're respectful, it's OK. It is kind of funny that people are just so suspicious anymore when you have a camera. Some people just don't like a camera pointed towards them. So that's also why I avoid a whole lot of uh, people photography. It's a little cowardice on my part. Yeah, definitely. The thing I love doing these days is photobombing people's stuff. Oh, yeah. like, just as I'm out and I see them <laughs> setting up the big group shot, I got to pull a, a goofy face in the background <laughs> because often you don't see this stuff. Yeah. You get the photo and you send it out to your friends and everyone's like, oh, that's a great <laughs> shot. Thanks. you know. And then all of a sudden, somebody's like, wait a second, who's this jerk in the background? It's like, that's me. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make you smile and trying to make your life a little bit more colorful. Yeah. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> and hopefully you can quickly and easily Photoshop me out. If you, it's, should, it's, you should totally charge them for <laughs> it. <too. laughs> Basically, were you saying that for people who are getting stuck and they're trying to stick with a daily creative habit, it's just to have fun? Yeah. Was that? Yeah, definitely. Because... I, life is so short and if you get hung up in all the excuses and you become a victim, I, I, I get tired of hearing that. I get tired of seeing it. To me, it's just move forward. Like you were saying earlier, just make stuff. Do I mean, my Corfu brand t-shirt, I have one of the shirts and it, it just said, it's my uh, logo and he's yelling, make stuff. And that's what it's about. It's about making things and then stopping and then assessing it and then going from there. Because if not, you're stagnant, you're not moving. Everybody is an artist. I mean, all my kids all started off drawing, but so at some point we just kind of fall off from that. We don't do it anymore. And it, it's kind of sad. I mean, everybody ha- looks at something a little different than somebody else. I have friends that are way better photographers than me and they're really great, but they look at things differently than I do. It doesn't mean that I don't have an angle or a twist that I can throw at it. I mean, if I base everything on, on everybody else's skill, then I would never make anything. And I think that's a great thing about your podcast is that you really find the right people that encourage people to go out and move forward because that's what it's about at the end of the day. I, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm doing anything special here. I feel like the people that we find are just, they're willing to come on the podcast and it's not like I'm able to tell that somebody would have that message. I feel like just as artists, we want other people to experience um, creativity and, and be able to like shake off any kind of fear or, or frustration or hesitation that we feel and then just keep moving forward. So uh, thank you very much. Um, well, I, and I, think you, I, I think you are a catalyst. I think you're the guy that's like yelling, hey, and you're getting an affinity group together, people that, that think the same way that are, because I mean, in general, I think artists kind of a lot of times are kind of insecure people, at least for me. And we kind of sometimes keep to ourselves. So once you start saying, hey, we're kind of all the same, and how we think and how we move, we kind of get together and get stronger and help each other out. I think that's awesome. I guess that's another question that I'm almost afraid to ask. And I don't want you to take it the wrong way, but it's like, who are you to write a book? <laughs> like, it's one thing to take a photo or to do a sketch and take a photo of that and then put it on Facebook. It's a whole other thing to put out a book and say, like, put your name on it and say, like, this, bam, this is mine. This is my book. You can go here. You can buy it. You can order it. But who are you? Because when I think about writing a book, it's like, who am I to, to say anything to anybody about anything? Like, do, do does my voice really count? Did you have that, that oh, same feeling? Or Yeah, totally. I'm I'm not a writer by trade. I mean, initially, I wanted to give the book away for free, but uh, a good friend had said, you know, you're devaluing the information by doing that. You've went through this long process. It's a lot of effort on your part, and then you're just going to give it away for free. Now, I'm not against giving stuff away for free, but sometimes we look at that as having less value, and that kind of hurts the message. And you're right. I, I really wrestle with this. I'm, I'm not a writer. I'm not this. I'm not a professional photographer. I mean, I love shooting photos. I have fun. But it's not my main bread and butter. So, yeah, I, I wrestle with that a lot. But at the end of the day, if I got bad reactions, which I really didn't, if I had people that would really come up to me and say that, that's a good response because I got somebody to move in some kind of direction, whether negative or po- a positive. And maybe they would read that and say, well, then I'm going to write one that's even better or whatever. Or maybe I encourage that person that is ahead of me in skill that was then going to do it. Then, then I've done something decent. I've done something great. 
Does that make sense? I like that. Yeah. yeah, and I like that take on it that even if it's perceived as not good or in a negative light by somebody else, maybe that's the the moment when they get inspired to say like, well, this guy did it. He's not so special, and I don't. I'm not so happy with the this thing that he put out. I'm going to do a better one. Exactly. And then like the world has the gift of this better version, and you're like, dang, that guy he won up me. You know what? I'm going to go back to the drawing board. I'm going to do a better version. I'm inspired by him. I'm going to give up any kind of negative uh, feelings and keep creating. I'm going to keep helping people because even though that one guy didn't like it, there was, you know, 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000, whatever, people that did like right. it. And those people, are, they're going to like really enjoy the second book because it's even better than the last one. Exactly. And the thing too is like that's the worst case scenario. Like a better one would be somebody that would give con- uh, constructive criticism saying, hey, I read your book, but next time, why don't you try this or try that? Well, then that's that's a, a massive win because then I'm going to get better. Somebody helped me out. You know, it's it's cool. Okay, so you, you've, you've done your year, uh, now you've gone through the writing process, and you've written your book. I, I want to hit the, this point home. It wasn't a huge book. Like, you don't have to turn these things into writing Atlas Shrugged. It's just a very straightforward book with your photographs in it as well that gives very easy to understand and apply knowledge. It seems like it's not that complicated. And whenever I think of the, the thought of writing a book, I'm like, oh my God, it's so many pages. How am I going to write that many pages? Like, well, what if you cut it into a quarter? Could you write a quarter of a book and just call it a handbook? Yeah, exactly. You know? And you, know, it, it's super useful because it is. It's, it's a, it's a little guide, it's a little handbook, and it wasn't. I, I didn't gear it for professionals. I didn't gear it for you know, tried and true people that, that, that this is all they do. Um, what it was is a, a book for encouragement to say, hey, look, here's a cool thing you can do. It's a lot of fun, and here's how you do it. I could have got into different lighting techniques and camera settings and things like that. But then it would be more of a manual. I didn't want that. I wanted something that was like, hey, this is this is cool. You should do this. I wanted other people to do this because then you've got all these people making really cool stuff. That's actually the thing that I, I loved about it the most is it's a book of encouragement. There's a lot of times we want to move forward, but we're not sure. And it's like we just need somebody to nudge us. And then we're fine once we're nudged. Uh, and I feel like this book could do that. Awesome. It's great that you say that because I'm kind of doing that right now. With I'm trying to start a t-shirt company. I'm backing off and it's so daunting producing it, uh, finding uh, fulfillment services and things like that, that I freeze up versus just stopping, backtracking. Really? Yeah, it's, yeah, for me, it's ugh. And of course, this is my perspective. I think making a t-shirt company is easy. You do the design, you make it as a vector so it can scale up and it can print really nicely. You find somebody to print them. Bada bing, bada boom. Now I got a t-shirt company. (laughs) You know, I mean, I I know it's not that simple. I I should say successful t-shirt company because I I have myself up on a a digital printing company and they do, you know, a solid job. But the experience, the purchase experience is not that great. Like you don't get anything like you get the t-shirt in a clear bag. It's just missing that extra coolness to it. So I'm kind of doing a t-shirt company the wrong way and I'm kind of backing off like I said on it and for me it requires a lot more research. I want to talk about launching this thing because I feel this is another sticking point. So you've you've done your project, you've got your book written and then it's like uh, should I release this out into the world or should I just let it die on my hard drive? I feel like I've got a lot of dead projects on my various hard drives. Even though they were as good as I could do them, I just I just felt like I wasn't good enough. And so they just sat there and died. Did you? I sat and messed with the cover for <laughs> two weeks. I was like, I don't know. I don't know if I like these icons. Do they make sense? And I got friends at work to look at it, you know, and they gave me great feedback. And yeah, I, I, I realized that I could sit and tinker with it forever and just never be happy with it. At, at some point, I was like, you know, I put a lot of work into this. I just need to pull the trigger on this thing and move on to the next project. Because that's the thing. Once you finally get to the end of the project, you're you're done with it. You want to move on to the next thing, hopefully. You want to try the next greatest thing. and So put a stamp on it and ship it. And that's where I got. But I mean, I, did, I still did have those insecurities about it. I had reached out to a guy, an uh, entrepreneurial guy that does um, – podcast i had mentioned you know how i had worked in a car factory for 11 years had very difficulty getting out of there to get in the art field and for me it was a success story it's really not because i don't feel i've arrived but I, I relayed this to him in an email and sent him a copy of my book and so he actually read my letter on his podcast which was awesome i was hoping that would turn into something some like good news but it actually really made me super nervous i i, I thought his whole community is going to listen to this thing and maybe they're going to read it and they're not going to like it so you know it's something you're always going to wrestle with but you can't let that stop your sidetrack. You got to keep moving. W- were you scared to send that guy a letter? Oh, yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, when he was reading it on the podcast, I was like, oh, 
this sounds so stupid, but that, that's, that's for me, you know, it's like, I should have said this, or I should have wrote that, you know, but it's okay. It, it, it's, it's out there. It's cool. There's always a ratio to these things. Yeah. Uh, as I've come to learn, like with almost everything in life, you want to get a date, you ask out 10 girls. Yeah. If it's a, if it's a 10% success ratio, one of them will say yes. And that's really like as, as difficult as it needs to be. You want to get on a podcast, you email 10 people, uh, maybe podcast has a 20% success ratio. Now you're on two podcasts. Successful business people, they, they fail all the time and they know that's part of the process. They keep failing and then they succeed. They just push through it. And that's what you have to do. I mean, there are so many things I could have done, should have, could have, would have, that I didn't do to fear and insecurities. And honestly, listening to your guys' podcast, it, that really helps me push through that kind of thing and not be hamstrung by, by fear and insecurity. Yeah, there's, it's such a weird thing. I, I've been thinking about this a lot, actually, this whole thing. I, I think when I was a kid, I didn't really have it when it came to art. Like I, I knew that there was people who were better than me, but I also knew that I would just become a video game artist. And it was sort of like, that was that. And it was really simple. And then I had a life-changing event. And then all my confidence just disappeared one day. And I haven't drawn a whole lot since then. At times, I feel like this huge, huge fraud that um, I'm doing this podcast, I'm running this website, and I'm not drawing every day, you know? But then again, I also feel like, well, I've had a long career and I've had all this uh, experience doing this stuff. And now my job is to help people, is to push people, oh, is to inspire people. And and I'm, you know, coming to terms with that. And it's like, you know, it's okay that I'm not the best artist. That's why we hire professional instructors to to do our courses. Right. They they're the ones that are the experts that are teaching you. What I'm an expert in is I hope being approachable and helping people to say see that, you know, this stuff isn't that isn't that difficult. And so I think through that, now I'm coming to this, I don't know what maybe the coach level of, of art. Um, and oh, yeah. uh, I'm coming to terms with that. And I think it's a, it's not a bad place for me to be. Honestly, that's such a critical thing to uh, uh, coaching. Mentorship is so important. And I, I don't have one right now. That's probably the next step for me is to, if, to find a mentor. And it's it's I've seen people that have gone through that process. Um, they get over the idea of, oh, I have to pay to get advice. But once they do that, the success is, is, you know, triple, uh, quadruple. It's, it's awesome. And it's something that's needed. You need that person to help guide you. And I, I see a lot of people doing that now and taking advantage of it and being very successful. I have something more, something none of your dry as dust professors and routine written doctors have love, devotion, passion. All right, we've covered, I feel like, a lot of stuff, um, but I want to go back because I feel like uh, your story is a little bit different and how you got started. Now you're an art director, but you started off on the assembly line. Yeah. Do I have that correct? Yeah, I worked at a, a Chrysler New York assembly, and uh, it started off as a summer job. I was working my way through school and wasn't able to pay, and I didn't want to go into debt with student loans, so I just went uh, to school part-time. Long story short, I ended up staying there for 11 years, and I got married, had a couple kids, and the money was easy, but it was so monotonous and so boring. And I'm not knocking anybody that actually likes to do that for a living. That's great. And I'm glad somebody likes to do that because somebody has to make cars or whatever. But for me, I wasn't wired that way. I wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't my thing. I was thankful for the experience, but the, the bad part was I didn't know any artists there. I didn't know how to get out. So even at this time, you knew that you wanted to do something creative. You wanted to do something with art. I, I still drew a lot. I, I actually used to draw coworkers. I did some artwork for, you know, when somebody was running against somebody else in the union, I would do humorous cartoons. Sometimes that got me in trouble. Some people don't like to be drawn. But, uh, you know, so I was always <laughs> doing that. And, you know, I, I, I had good response. People like really responded to my artwork. And I was like, yeah, this is really cool. My cartooning style. I mean, I went to a pretty decent school. It wasn't strictly an art school, but it was a four-year. I got a uh, four-year uh, in illustration. But they didn't really train me on how to get out, how to escape. And I, I was just guessing. I was kind of floundering. But I just kept trying. And I, that would be my advice is just keep trying. I mean, you have to stop and, and self-assess and make sure you're, you know, if you're trying something multiple times it doesn't work, you, you're going to have to change something. But, um, yeah, it was a real struggle, and I didn't know how to get out. And it almost broke me, honestly. I almost gave up on it, and I'm glad I didn't. You know, eventually an opportunity came, and then you are able to jump on it, and that was <laughs> you're out, or did you? No. Because you are there for, you know, such a long period of time. Yeah. How do you make that transition to to get onto the path where you are right now? Because it seemed like, you are you know, you're going down the tracks one way. you you got to get on a completely different train. Yeah, it was totally fear. I mean, I, I, I was like, well, I'm not getting any younger. I'm not going to be able to get in the field. So I really kicked up into over 
Uber driver. And my poor wife, she goes, if you hate it so bad there, why don't you just quit? So I, I, I quit in a smart way. I basically got a leave of absence without pay and went up to the front. And the plant manager was actually a really cool guy. He was like, he knew what I was doing. He was like, you know what, if you want to seek better things, awesome, go for it. You, you have my blessing. So basically left there for six months without pay. Um, and I went to, I made the mistake of going to a placement agency. Those, those guys are brutal. I mean, if it's your last resort, okay, cool. You know, they take a lot of your check. So I left Chrysler and went to a, a pharmaceutical advertising agency and uh, was working as a freelancer and making half the pay that I was, uh, no medical. And I had kids at the time. So it was really scary. I actually don't know how I kept my car or my house. And my wife, somehow she still kept her hair. She didn't go bald from the stress. But from there, I was able to network with people. Um, my coworkers were just really great people. You know, they turned me on to Paul Rand and people that I didn't, I didn't study. So I started reading about the grid and different logo designers and, and topography. And I just started learning on my own that way. And with the encouragement of them, I, I just got better. And then from there, I was able to actually find another job um, in the field. So I pretty much have been in advertising ever since then. It's been a great ride, man. And I look back and I think, man, this is awesome. I've, I've arrived. But like uh, Dan Davis said uh, from uh, Steam Crow, he was like, you know, he, he felt like he'd arrived, but he really didn't arrive. He felt like, man, there's, there's more to this than where I'm at. And I, I feel the same way. I feel like I got to keep moving, keep growing. And um, I'm actually very thankful for the time in the factory because it actually helps me appreciate when I do have a quote unquote good job. And I can, you know, enjoy actually using my skill as an illustrator or a designer versus twisting bolts. So it gives you a different perspective. I mean, I work with a lot of people that are great people. I've worked with some people that are they're fresh out of school and their their expectations of what they deserve are so high. It's ridiculous. You're like, wow, you kind of need to toe the line for a while before you think that you're going to be this senior this or senior that. So. I'm starting to sound like an old guy now, I know. There's two things that I that I really like that you just said. One of them definitely hasn't been said on the podcast before. And the idea is to take a leave of absence without pay. So you are taking a risk, but you're not taking as big a risk as quitting your job, right. which is, I think, the, the option that most people are like, well, if I want to do art full time, I got to quit my job. And you basically cut that lifeline. Yeah. But if you take a leave of absence without pay, this is an option. I mean, it's just a headache to get a new employee in. If you're willing to say, look, uh, I would like a, a leave of absence without pay. Are you cool with that? I'm yeah, you'd be surprised how many people are okay with it because everybody wants to see everybody succeed to an extent. For me, it it was like, what if I got out? I was taking a big risk. What if I got out and I hated it? The, the good thing about working in a factory is once you punch the clock and you're done for the day, you're, you're done for the day. You can go do whatever. But yeah, it's, to me, it's calculated escape is what I called it. And I didn't want to put my family at a higher risk than they needed to be. So the other thing that I thought was really interesting was maybe you don't cherish the bad times, but you're thankful for them because it makes where you are now seem so much better because you have something to compare yes. it against. Yeah. So if you're listening and you're in a really rough spot, don't necessarily hate on it that much because it's sort of setting your expectations at a at a level that once you have something that a lot of other people might consider, well, this is just you know normal. It's like, no, 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 this isn't normal. This is the gravy train. Like my life is so good right now. You don't know about, well, in my case, like how I lived in a house that had all the windows boarded up with plastic over them in the summer and it was hot and it was infested with crickets. <laughs> now it doesn't matter where I live. It's better than that place. So I'm pretty much happy sleeping anywhere as long as it's, you know, it's not infested with bugs. So I think that's another great pl point because a lot of people are like, oh, you know, they're not so happy with where they're at. But, you know, you're at the perfect place to be and you can always find other opportunities and improve things if that's what you're after. All right, the last thing that I want to ask you, because I'm trying to figure out a way that we can encourage people to become members of Pencil Kings or, or look at the site or do more, but you're actually a member and you did one of the tutorials with your daughter, yeah. which I thought was really cool. If you're willing to, could you talk just a little bit about what that was like, that experience of working together with your daughter and, and what you thought of the lesson? Because I want to try and help more people, but you know they're sitting on the edge and Hearing it from me doesn't really count. It, it counts hearing it from somebody else. Well, yeah, the tutorials are great because, well, the first one was the ultimate uh, Photoshop guide. And like I said, I, kn I know a lot about Photoshop. I've been using it for decades or actually about 20 years. Um, but there was things that I, that I saw in there that I didn't know. So the tutorials always have those little tricks that if you stick to them, you'll, it'll be such a time saver. But for me, 
I wanted to do something that my daughter, who's an artist, is wanted to do as well. And she's new to Photoshop. So I thought, well, this is a great project that we can sit down and do together. And it was a lot of fun. And it was really encouraging. And I would be at work and she would text me, hey, dad, I'm on this thing. I learned how to do this. And she would, you know, send me a screenshot That's of what awesome. she was doing. I was like, man, it's really it made my day. Because you want your kids to be better than you are. So, um, so for me, it was totally worth. Honestly, what you guys charge is, is a steal because it's it is an education, and you don't have to go to a four year to to learn from the best how to do these things. And so, I actually have done a couple of the tutorials. Now, I did the storyboard one. That one's really really good too because I'm not. I've, I've been doing storyboards at work, but I didn't know a lot of the shortcuts. I didn't know any information from other people that have been doing this for a living. So it's a great way to get that information and then apply it to your skills and make yourself better. Um, the other one was uh, uh, the Francis Vallejo, the, the, uh, the drawing one. And that's just, it was awesome. You watch something like that and it just makes you want to stop right then and there. And instead of watching reruns of uh, Walking Dead, sit down and get your sketchbook out and just start drawing or inking. And that's what it's about. Nice. It's about using utilizing your time the best way. So I can't say enough good about the um, the tutorials. I love them. Thanks a lot, James. Yeah. Now, where can people find your work? Um, if you've got your T-shirt company up, where can people find that? Uh, and definitely, well, let's mention the title of the book again, uh, so people can find it on Amazon. Because I think it's 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 definitely worth picking up. Cool. Thanks, man. Uh, yeah, the book. If you just go to Amazon and you look for "Surviving a Year," uh, it'll it'll come up. It's one of the top ones, and uh, you can get it. Uh, a digital version, you get a print version. Uh, in, in fairly reasonable. I think I dropped the price down to like ninety nine cents. It's pretty much, you know. I'm yeah, almost I, I bought it. I think for a buck. Yeah. It was like it was no brainer. Yeah. So and hopefully, you know, it, it encourages you to move forward. Uh, my portfolio site is uh, jamescornett.com, and that's c o r n e t t e dot com. And then I'm all over the place. I'm a Tumblr. Uh, if you look for cornfu or cornet, I'll show up on Tumblr. I got a bunch of stuff everywhere, but I, I think you can get to most of that from my personal website. Okay, cool. So that's jamescornett.com. Mm -hmm. Photography is uh, cornfu.com. Like F-U at the end? <laughs> yep. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast, sharing your story. I hope that if you're listening and you needed a kick in the butt, take this as your your audio kick in the butt. Try and do a new a hobby for a week. You know, Sketch for five minutes a day for a week straight. See if you can do it. Excellent. And then if you can... Uh, shoot me a message and, and let me know how it went. As always, we'll have the show notes for this and we'll have links to James's site and everything else if you didn't catch them at pencilkings.com slash James Cornette. That'll be J-A-M-E-S dash C-O-R-N-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Awesome. Thanks so much, James. Thanks, Mitch. Why don't you head over to PencilKings.com slash free, where we've put together a 30-day course that's going to teach you the ins and outs of drawing the face, along with homework and printable study guides that you can use wherever you are in the world.